Who's your favorite draft class? Well, Rob Rag is going to tell you, and I think we'll probably chime in as well today. Then we got to talk about the big picks, the sleepers, the ones that are super value. And then we'll talk just a touch about the process of the NFL, what surprised us about this draft, as we take a recap with Rob Rang from Fox Sports today on Locked On NFL Draft. You are Locked On NFL Draft, your daily podcast covering the NFL Draft. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Locked On NFL Draft Show. I am your host, former NFL and NFL defensive back, Eric Crocker. And of course, as always, joined by my guy, my co-host, Ryan Tracy, Rogue Analytics, and Got Rob Rang joining us today. Of course, it's Thursday episode, and we all want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Exciting times, uh, Rob. I haven't been able to talk to you because of a mishap <laughs> last week <laughs> with what happened, and I wasn't able to be on the show. But I'm definitely excited to hear you know some of your thoughts on this draft class. So we definitely want to dive in and get to uh, some of your grades and maybe some of the things that surprised you. I do want to start with one thing and ask you. What your thoughts were because we've been doing draft grades on divisions and I gave this team the best grade so far in the A plus the Houston Texans. I believe that they got a legit five starters and I didn't think they just got five starters because it's the Houston Texans and they need work on their team and their roster. But I like what they did at one Stingley or you get Stingley. That's a starter. You get uh Jalen Petrie. I believe he'd start on most teams. Uh, and teams will bring him in to be a starter. Uh, you had Harris, you had uh, uh, Pierce, the running back, and running backs drafting the fourth round. Like, you want him to be the guy. I feel like I'm missing. Guy. Oh, John Mechie. I feel like he can come in and be like a legit, at least, you know, third option for most teams. So, what were your thoughts on what the Houston Texans did? I, I love all the selections that you just highlighted, Croc. I'd also mention out the number 15 overall selection, Kenyon oh. Green. Green, I mean, Kenyon Mike, Green. There we go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Green is gold. Is it's an old Robert Frost poem there, and uh, you know, and I, I think that it is poetry with the way that the Houston Texans were able to kind of build up their team. Um, you know, and and just the fact that you mentioned all those other players, and I'll, I'll kind of you know gush about Green here for a couple of minutes, just because I really think that the, the positional versatility that he offers that club, um, and what he did at Texas A and M, obviously as a relatively local prospect. Um, I, I think that, that that helps put butts in the seats, and I think that it also helps protect the quarterback. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are kind of questioning the, the wisdom of the, the trade that Houston made for Laramie Tunsil. I think that if you put a really quality guard next to Laramie Tunsil, then, then he's the more likely to be that much more effective. And that's exactly what I think that Kenyon Green is. And, and again, I'm, I'm a big fan of Stingley. Oh, my goodness, am I a fan of Stingley. We're going to talk a little bit later about some of the surprises of this year's draft. I think the fact that you had a cornerback go number three and number four higher than we've ever seen the top two cornerbacks ever go in NFL draft history, that was obviously one of the big surprises, at least in my opinion, of this year's uh, NFL draft just in general, but I agree with you, Croc. I, I think that the Houston Texans, I think that their AFC South divisional foes, the Jacksonville Jaguars also had a spectacular draft. I think that when we're talking about the great drafts of this year, and I know this is low hanging fruit guys, but as you mentioned, Croc, we, we haven't had a chance that all three of us get together. The New York Jets, J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. I, I thought that what they did was absolutely spectacular. The three first-round selections, guys, I thought all three of them should have wound up going in the top 10. And then Brees Hall to cap it off. And, you know, another guy who I thought was a legitimate first-round pick, they get in the top portion of the second round as well. Uh, I really think that we're talking about the AFC really was the dominant conference, not only on ability in the, in the both teams or both divisions and, and excuse me, both conferences in the NFL, but I thought that that played out on draft day as well. I'm not going to argue. I'm going to sit here and uh, I'll root for the NFC, right? I, I have to think that at the end of the day, it started hot and then it kind of went, eh, but the Eagles did really well. And I have to say, I'm not used to using this team. The Detroit Lions helped themselves in a number of ways. 
They were bold not only in moving up for Jameson Williams. They were bold in taking Josh Pascoe that I think you're going to have to find the right fit for, particularly in that scheme. I'd like some of their lower draft picks as well. Malcolm Rodriguez is an instant starter on special teams, and I think he will grow into a linebacker that you can get on the field, particularly in passing downs, and get something out of. They took a chance on the HBCU guy in James Houston from Jackson State. Like They did a lot of good things, but at the end of the day, come on, who are we kidding? The Ravens won this draft. There's nobody who did better at getting their guys, is there? Think it was the Ravens? I, I still think I, the I don't know. The more I look, <laughs> I like what the Eagles did too. You know, the Eagles, you talk about kind of what they did up front, getting big, you know, Jordan Davis to be able to play next to Fletcher Cox. Then on the back end, being able to get a guy like Nicobe Dean in the third round. I know there's some medical questions there, but just in the sense of, you know, getting a guy that if he is healthy, and I know there are some questions with him moving backwards and coverage and things like that, but man, against the run and running sideline to sideline and how quickly he closes in space, I think, I don't know, I like a lot of what they did as well, especially early on. It's funny that you mentioned that because Rob, isn't Cam Jurgens their best draft pick? <laughs> well, he, he might be. I mean, I, I love Cam Jurgens. I mean, that, that was a guy that, you know, I, I was sitting in, in Seattle's, uh, not their war room, but their media room and, and kind of just saying like, this is a guy that Seattle should be prioritizing right here. Center is a cons- position of concern. I mean, you know, of course, Croc knows it very well playing or watching teams in the same division. And then Ryan, you know, it also with a guy that was with Kansas city, Austin Blythe, that's who is Seattle is anticipating being their starting center. Cam Jurgens was a guy that Seattle should have been, you know, prioritizing very, very highly. But, um, you know, again, to kind of go back to the conversation you guys were just having in terms of just the draft picks, I, I think that we got to talk about the Baltimore Ravens here for a second. I mean, just the way that Croc just kind of broke down, you know, all the different really good selections there for the Houston Texans. I mean, you look at Baltimore, Kyle Hamilton, Tyler Linderbaum, David Ajabo, Travis Jones. You know, I to me in the fourth round, I thought that it was just beautiful that the way the Baltimore kind of set this up. You know, Eric DaCosta, he just recognized that this was a unique draft class and that the talent was going to be bloated. There was going to be a lot better, you know, depth in this year's class. So to be able to position themselves to have all of those fourth round picks, in my opinion, the, the sweetest of sweet spots in this draft to have all of those picks. I mean, six <laughs> fourth round selections, that's unheard of. And, and that to me just kind of shows the the intuitiveness uh, of the intuition of the Baltimore Ravens that they were planning ahead for this. And I thought they just absolutely knocked it out of the park. Yeah, they did a good job. And we're going to find out which rookies we feel are going to knock it out of the park. When we get back, we're going to talk a little bit about the offensive and defensive rookies of the year. I can't wait to hear these guys' thoughts on that. But first, we definitely want to talk to you a little bit about Rock Auto. And with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need for your vehicle. All right, why endure often pointless and seamless intimidating questioning about your vehicle and wait while this person behind the counter orders only the parts that their computer has, choosing only brand in a warehouse happens to cover. All right, you have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket, so use it. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. All right, why choose to spend 30%, 50%, or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do it your service for over 20 years. All right, Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer, and they have everything that you can need, whether it's brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, or even carpet. All right, and um, go explore their easy to use website today and find a solution for your auto parts. All right. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. And right locked on in there, how did you hear about us, Box, so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. We definitely want to thank you for making the Locked On NFL Draft your first listen of the day. Locked On Network, man, got experts, local experts, whether it's football, baseball, basketball, all the sports, HBCU covering conferences, all that good stuff. So, you know, they're local experts covered in 30 minutes or less. So make sure you tune into everything that we have going on. And speaking of going on right now, we are getting into rookie of the year, guys. And we'll start on the offensive side of the ball. I'll let you guys go first and then I'll kind of get my opinion. But uh, Rob, since you're the guest here on this Thursday episode, 
who do you like to win offensive rookie of the year? All right, guys. So I'm going to mention a couple of players here. I I think that you can easily talk about Kenny Pickett from the Pittsburgh Steelers because let's face it, we know that what happens when it comes to the rookie of the year voting, it's almost always going to be a quarterback. And who are the quarterbacks in this year's beleaguered draft class is likely to actually start? Well, that'd be Kenny Pickett with the Pittsburgh Steelers. So sure, just give him a little bit of a tip of the cap, but let's focus in on some of the other players. Ken Walker uh, with the Seattle Seahawks. They didn't draft him in the second round to have him sit on the sideline, guys. I I think that he has a chance to absolutely get the rock a lot and then potentially put up some pretty splashy numbers. So I think that you have to give him a little bit of credit. If we're going to switch to the strongest position, of this year's skill position guys the wide receiver position i think that christian watson with the green bay packers given everything that green bay gave up two second round picks to move up to be able to select him his size his speed his reliable hands going catching passes from aaron Rodgers. you know that he wants to prove that he is not just Devonte adams and a bunch of other guys he wants to prove that he can be just as successful as other receivers. I think that Christian Watson is the receiver in Green Bay who is going to splash. But if you want to ask me, my number one guy that I think is going to win the Offensive Rookie of the Year in the NFL this year, Chris Olave, New Orleans Saints. Talking mm. about wide receivers who I think are going to splash. Jameis Winston throwing the deep ball to Olave. Me, sign me up. Yeah, Olave is oh, my, my second guy that I have. And uh, yeah, you, you talk about who's there at quarterback and you you, know, you have Jamison, w- w- Jameis Winston and he has never been shy about throwing the ball vertically downfield and trying to fit in in tight windows downfield. Whatever it is, he's definitely going to take his shots and he might throw 30 interceptions in the process, but he's also going to throw 30 touchdowns in the process of doing that. And Chris Olave, I think he might be a big beneficiary of that. What do you think, Ryan? I, I'm I'm gonna tell you you're all wrong. That's what I'm, I've been thinking all day about this, and I was gonna go Drake London because his skill set transfers like that. He doesn't need anything else. He will take the ball away from defenders, but somebody's got to get it to him. So I'm gonna take the dark horse. I don't think Mariota's the quarterback. I say Desmond Ritter is the offensive player of the year. Wow, That's that is it. That is a sleeper. That was pretty surprising, and I don't have Desmond Ritter getting it, but <laughs> I do have Traylon Burks. Getting it on the offensive side of the ball, that, that's my guy. You talk about a guy who has an established veteran quarterback. They're going to definitely look to get him the ball early and often in the sense of how he plays and his play style. I mean, his he was they were talking about him being like A.J. Brown. Well, A.J. Brown gets traded away. He fits in that role. I'm not saying he's going to be A.J. Brown as soon as he steps on the field and be that big-time polarizing receiver that A.J. Brown was with Tennessee. But I just think in the sense of, Knowing how to utilizing him, the run after catch ability, you know, the, the big shots off of the play action pass. I think there's an opportunity for him to have a very, very good rookie year, even though I think there's areas where he needs to be a little bit more refined with his route running and things like that. I won't worry about that. I think he's going to be a big play guy. And yeah, so now let's go to the defensive side of the ball. And I'll start here. And I'm going to go with Jordan Davis, big guy again. Playing next to a guy like Fletcher Cox. I like what they're doing on defense. I think he's going to be a guy that is, you look at, one, just how he tested. I think the way he tested, I think that shows up on film. A guy that's able to, you know, chase guys from the backside with pursuit. I think if he can just add a little bit more in the pass rush game where he's getting some sacks and those numbers go up, that's why I think he's going to win uh, defensive rookie of the year. And you're not going to be able to double him because you have to pay a lot of attention to Fletcher Cox as well who's also on the line playing next to him. So that's why I have, who do you have, Rob? Well, I, as you just said, crack, I mean, I, I think that it, this all comes down to sacks. You know, that, that is the, the flashy statistic that usually winds up winning somebody, the defensive rookie of the year honors. So I think that there's a mon- a number of guys that you could mention. You can mention Ed Bikini with the Atlanta Falcons. The fact that they were last in the NFL a year ago in sacks and Ed Bikini, top of the second round, he has that ability to be able to just kind of feast upon a, a group of pretty mediocre tackles in the NFC South. So to me, he is one of those players. Sting will be kind of touched upon him with the Houston Texans. I just think that the ball skills on this guy are just absolutely incredible. I don't know that he's going to wind up being defensive rookie of the year, but I would bet money 
on the idea that Derek Stanley is going to wind up being an interception champion in the NFL at some point in his career. I think this guy is absolutely going to be a Pro Bowl kind of a, a kind of a player. Drake Jackson with the San Francisco Four, or excuse me, uh, the Forty Niners. I, I think is a guy that you know really is is going into a position to be successful, just considering all the talent that they have on that team as well. Sam Williams, Dallas Cowboys, another guy. But again, if I was going to go with a guy that maybe is his low hanging fruit, but Kayvon Tibble, I talked about him all year long. I thought the people were kind of starting to sleep on him a little bit. He went from being overrated to underrated to wind up being the top five selection that he was the entire time. The New York Giants, Croc, you just mentioned what that Jordan Davis has next to him and Fletcher Cox. What about what Kayvon Thibodeau has next to him with Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence on that New York Giants front? I think Kayvon Thibodeau is going to wind up pushing for 10 plus sacks as a rookie. And considering the New York environment, how does he not get all of the buzz mm. if he winds up playing that well? Nope. You stole my guy. <laughs> Tim is my number two, but I will tell you, it is going to be a secondary player because I don't think any of these edges are going to make a 10-sack season out of what's coming to them. So who's the guy that has the best cast around him, both in his rookie class and what's already there? It's easy. He ran slow, and I don't care. It's Kyle Hamilton. He will make the most impact as a defensive player as a rookie. I can see that. And uh, one other guy that I forgot to mention as well, Brees Hall, running back, drafted by the New York Jets. I know they have Michael Carter there, but – Look at Brees Hall. And I, again, another guy. They didn't draft him in the second round for him to be on the bench. I think they want him to kind of be that bell cow, catch pass, passes out of the backfield. It's going to fit that outside zone stretch uh, that they like to do there coming from that Shanahan type scheme. So Brees Hall, keeping an eye out on him. And I know just the place for everyone who wants to place bets, and that's Bet Online. All right. BetOnline.net is the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information, including. Offense and Defensive Rookie of the Year. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs that are going on right now. Major League Baseball scores, my Giants starting to pick it back up again. Fights and even next season's uh, futures when it comes to the NFL. All right, Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information from live betting, the playoffs, esports, and much more. Head over right now to the website today and use their mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. On on at Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, y'all. So let, let's talk about some trends, right? We can talk about Bet Online and some of the trends and the action that's going on. There's some trends I see going on in the NFL, and I want to know if these things are going to continue. One, it is unheard of to see quarterbacks that got hyped so much, right? And quarterbacks get pushed up draft boards, like regardless of how good you think someone is or whatever, they go much higher than they typically are supposed to go. Well, that wasn't the case this year. Yeah, one guy, Kenny Pickett, going in the first round, who Rob Brink thinks is unquestionably the officer rookie of the year. But after that, I mean, you couldn't find another guy, a uh, quarterback going until the third round. And even some guys like Sam Howell, what round did Sam Howell go? Fifth round to Washington Commanders? So, you know, that's a little unheard of. Our team's going to stop reaching for some of these younger guys, if they don't feel like this is guy, they're probably going to come in and play right away. Are, are we going to see this trend uh, be pretty consistent of taking quarterbacks much later? I mean, we're talking about just a year after seeing five quarterbacks go in the first 15 picks. No. I, I don't no, think that we're. Good. I think I think that this was was very much a a one and done type of a year. I think that this was a, a year that the teams just you know, recognize that this was not a very good quarterback class and that next year's quarterback class looks outstanding, just like the 2021 crop was outstanding. That's why there were five quarterbacks that, that wound up going among those top 15 picks. Some would argue that the quarterback who was the last of those five quarterbacks going from the top 15 picks, Mac Jones, was the best of the bunch. I mean, if you look at his statistics, the fact that he was the guy that led his team at least – arguably led his team to the playoffs, certainly was part of the playoffs. defense team. and run game was kind of good. He won exactly. a game where he threw three passes. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that's fair. 
But at the same time, I think that there might, I don't think there's a quarterback in this year's class who is going to wind up winning any games where he completes just three passes. Although right. maybe Ryan's right with Desmond Ritter. It's going to be interesting to kind of see that. But going back to your initial point here, Eric, I, I just don't think that you are going to see teams adopt this strategy moving forward. I think that they are certainly going to always prioritize the best players available. And it just so happened that quarterbacks was not that case. What was the case this year is cornerbacks and wide receivers. We saw a record class of cornerbacks come off the board, at least in comparison to the way things have gone over the last 20 years. Absolutely spectacular number of cornerbacks. I mentioned number three and number four overall. You just look at the entire class as a whole. It stacks up to any class that we've ever seen. The wide receiver class, it's even easier. You know, six wide receivers among the first 18 picks. That's never happened. We saw double that, 13 actually, wind up going by the end of the second round. That's never happened. I mean, I think that is just a reflection of both, both receiver and quarterback that, hey, mamas, allow your sons to grow up to be wide receivers and quarterback because they're going to get paid. And the NFL teams don't want to pay it. So they're going to draft players at those positions because they want to be able to pay the young guys rather than overpay on those second contracts. And I think that's going to speed up. And Croc, I'm glad you brought up the quarterbacks first because this was this was the topic that is simultaneously two different things for me. One, this is renewing my faith in the NFL, at least in the front offices, because they stuck to their evaluations for the first time in a long time. And it's a lesson learned for me because I let myself do the normal thing, get carried away, and I pop guys up figuring the NFL's going to ignore the evaluations. They're going to take them early anyway. So for my process, evaluating the evaluators, now I have to say, wait, there's a lot of younger GMs. I think the, the GM average age, the mean age of the general managers in this league fell by five years in the last three seasons. That's significant. And I think that's part of what we're getting here. That's why we're seeing, I think, the rush on the wide receivers. I think that's going to balance itself out as well. And for me, now I have to keep in my brain for next season, who's going to make sure that they stick to their guns again? And is there how much pop-up is there going to be? This class is drastically different in 2023. The quarterbacks are going to be – I there could be five in the top half of the draft, uh, of the round, yeah. first round. We'll definitely see see if that happens. But one thing I kind of want to bring a little context here or maybe something that people aren't really thinking about, right? And Davis Mills, he's kind of the forgotten guy in the 2021 class because, well, he wasn't a first-round pick. So everyone talks about the Trevor Lawrences and Justin Fields, Trey Lance and Mac Jones and Zach Wilson and all those guys. They've gotten all the love on social media. Who's going to be – the you know the guy to take that second year jump they're talking about all those guys they're not talking about davis mills who might have been the second best rookie quarterback in all of the class in the sense of how well he played some of the things he did the trajectory of it and they're not talking about him that way because he's a third round pick but if you're a team and you see what houston was able to do and you see how he played in comparison to the other guys well why not maybe kind of wait and see if there's a guy that you can maybe groom. So, you know, you see what the, what the teams did this year. And I think, man, is that the better way to go about it? it Rob, Rob, you talked about the receivers. And I think that is going to be something, again, talking about trends here. Our team's going to be going away from paying receivers the big money. And, I mean, you see one, Hollywood Brown, I think he was traded for a different reason. It seemed like he just didn't care for how he was being utilized. But you did see Debo Samuel be a little upset. And it's like, hey, I think it's a money issue. You see A.J. Brown. I mean, Tennessee and A.J. Brown, they weren't even close with the money at all. They were talking about them offering $16 million per year. It's like, bro, like, no way am I taking that. All right, so I think those are definitely some trends there that I'm curious to see how those things continue to play out. Yeah, I think that in, in the case of Davis Mills, I mean, I think that the Houston Texans just wound up getting themselves a quarterback who, if he had not had the durability issues that he had at Stanford, then he would have wound up being drafted earlier. And I, I think for all of the hype that we saw the other quarterbacks, people who were paying attention, um, I, I think saw Davis Mills kind of slowly but steadily kind of improve his play throughout his this rookie season. So kudos to the the Houston Texans, Nick Casario and, and Levy Smith for kind of sticking with their guns. And as Ryan was saying before, not 
falling in love with the upside of these quarterbacks and kind of biting at the cheese, so to speak, just kind of believing in what you already have on the fold. I, I think that Davis Mills would have been available in this year's draft class, guys. We might be talking about two quarterbacks going in the first round. I think the talent is legitimate, and it's just been the durability factor with him. So I, I think that that is something that we can expect to see that trend continue, that if teams feel that they can get a guy in the second and third round at the quarterback, back position the money and the ability to be able to get another impact player earlier on that just makes too much sense not to not to continue if you can pull it off and that's probably better for a lot of these young prospects so you have the ability to kind of just develop at your own pace and they're not a rush to where oh right away you have to be the guy obviously i covered the San Francisco 49ers if you're watching on youtube right now make sure you subscribe to locked on nfl draft youtube channel but you see the 49er has behind me and they drafted the quarterback number three overall last year trade lance and they trade up a lot of and use a lot of draft capital to get them well he's expected to come in and, and if he doesn't make the playoffs with his team he's like oh he's a bust you know and that's tough for these young guys so they don't truly have the opportunity to kind of sit and really learn the game and be able to kind of master it. And coaches are forced to have to play guys, you know, much sooner as opposed to let them sit and let things happen a little bit more organically like we've seen in the past. But, you know, you have guys like Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow and some of these guys who have, you know, been very good early on. And now guys have to play much, much earlier and the expectations are much higher. I think it's a little unfortunate, but we'll see which one of these trends continue to stick uh, Rob, definitely want to thank you for joining us on today's podcast. And we want to thank all of you for making us your first listen of the day once again. Uh, we will be back tomorrow to talk NFC East and break down all the draft grades for the Dallas Cowboys, Philadelphia Eagles, New York Giants, and what's the last thing? What's Washington the last Commanders. Thing? Washington Commanders, of course, of course, the Washington Commanders. But until next time, we will see y'all. We are out. Peace.